a little bit closer. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we come this morning uh, expecting to hear from you, Lord, whether we're uh, down at Showcase this morning, uh, they're gathered uh, sort of uh, with one another, or whether we're in our own homes across the city and beyond this morning. Lord, we thank you that we can come to you this morning expecting to hear from you. Father, we've seen over the past couple of days an election result, sort of-ish, almost at some point. But Lord, we come this morning not sort of maybe hoping that we might have an indication or a prediction of hearing from you, but we know that we definitely authoritatively will hear from you this morning. Lord, we thank you that we turn to your word and we hear your voice and we see yourself in it. Help us all this morning, open our eyes to be able to see you, open our ears to be able to hear from you and open our hearts, Lord, to respond to you. I pray, Lord, that you might speak through me this morning to us and you might mould us uh, in the ways that you would want to this morning for your glory and for our good. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I quoted to you uh, some song lyrics last week from the song uh, Love Will Tear Us Apart from Joy Division. I want to begin this morning with another song, um, not just uh, in the sort of cause of sort of musically uh, slightly indoctrinating you, although should you wish to follow up those bands, you won't be disappointed. Listen to these lyrics here from the song Better Man by Pearl Jam. It says this, waiting, watching the clock, it's four o'clock, it's got to stop, tell him no more. She practices her speech. As he opens the door, she rolls over, pretends to sleep as he looks her over. She lies and says she's still in love with him. She can't find a better man. Tells a story of uh, a, a woman settling for any man, a bad man, in fact, even as we're sort of hinted at here, because she feels as though she might not be able to find a better man. As we pick up the story in Ruth chapter two this morning, we, we left it off last week at the end of chapter one with Ruth and Naomi uh, leaving Moab and, and uh, Naomi at least returning to the land of the people of God and Ruth going to that land from her homeland. And they left having both lost men. Naomi has lost her husband, Elimelech, and lost her two sons, Marlon and Kilion, and Ruth has lost her husband. And they're in need, at least as far as the story goes here, of a man. For their future, their economic security and their hope, they really need a man who can provide, who can love them, who can provide, quite crucially, uh, an heir uh, to the line of Elimelech, but then also for Naomi and Ruth themselves. But the big question is, is the most that Ruth and Naomi can hope for that they may have to settle? Will they perhaps find themselves in the position of the woman in this song, lying and saying they love him because they can't find a better man? One of the things you'll notice about the book of Ruth is, or hopefully you will, is that it's a very sophisticated book. It, it, it's much more like a sort of a play. And, you know, this might bring back sort of bad memories for you or perhaps no memories if you just didn't do the work. But back in school, when you sort of look at Shakespeare and stuff, it's much more like a play with different scenes and different acts. And we've transitioned from one act over in Moab into the next one here as they return to Bethlehem. And the question I think we're caused to ask this morning that we think about is, how will God provide for Ruth and for Naomi? And how will he provide, indeed, for us? And what we see is at the heart of God's provision here, and God's provision for us too, actually, is that very thing, that he will provide a better man. And we see him introduced here in this chapter. Turn with me there to those first seven verses. And what I want to show you is a, a chance encounter. We're introduced to this new scene here with that abrupt now Naomi uh, and Ruth. And they set off for the land of Bethlehem, the homeland for uh, Naomi, but a new land for Ruth. And it's really the reverse of where the story's begun. Naomi leaving her homeland for a new land and a new life. And now the narrator, the storyteller, gives us the readers a hint that the characters themselves don't yet know. 
this is the equivalent of a sort of stage note for us, a bit of a sort of spoiler really to the whole thing. We're told here that uh, they had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. This might not seem as significant perhaps as it, as it sort of is to the storyteller and in the original context here. It's perhaps useful to know just a little bit about the way in which uh, Israelite society worked at this time. To understand Boaz's role and to understand why this was such an amazing, miraculous, gracious uh, provision of God and such a source of hope that the two characters don't yet know. They find that out as the story progresses but the narrator wants us to see a little bit beforehand. Israelite society, uh, like many societies still today, actually, in the global south and into the east, are collectivist. And what that means is, I guess the easiest way to describe it is to describe it against its opposite. Its opposite is an individualist society. We in the West live in a highly individualist society. That is, we conceive of the world and our choices and the way in which we live our life very much through the lens of myself. I am the primary authority. I'm the primary sort of person that I'm really considering as to where the sort of benefit and the blessing comes from this decision. We're an individualistic society. It's all about you do you as the Diet Coke advert has told us. But Israel was a collectivist society. That is that at its very core, the whole idea of being connected to other people, to something bigger than yourself, and the demands and responsibilities of actually caring for other people as well, informs the way in which you make every decision in your life. And so there are a number of key sort of elements and parts of Israelite society. It starts with an individual, yes, but then you're also part of a family. And then you're also part of a clan, a wider grouping of families put together. And this is where Boaz will later fit in. And then beyond that, beyond the level of clans, there's tribes. We know the 12 tribes of Israel as well. And then beyond that, you have the nation. And at every level, there's expectations and responsibilities. But the clan was the most important level. This is where you were really responsible to one another and for one another. And the idea was that uh, the way that you make your decisions was to be shaped around that. And the way in which you saw the world was to be shaped by this idea of being identified as part of a particular clan. Let me just explain to you, even in, in modern terms, how this plays out and how this plays out differently even today. Take a film like Titanic. And, you know, many of you will know the story of that, the story of, of Rose due to marry uh, Cal and heir to a, a Pittsburgh steel fortune. It's somewhat of an arranged marriage, and it's not necessarily the most sort of happy of relationships, and indeed, he's not the nicest of uh, men. But her family has fallen into financial difficulty, and without a significant uh, event like this, being married into a, a steel uh, heir's fortune, her family is really on the, uh, at the brink of financial ruin. And not only with the economic consequences of that, but especially in the particular time in which this is written, sort of 1900 or so, uh, the, um, the embarrassment and the shame of once having money, once having influence, and now you know, just being like the rest of us. And so Rose is uh, sort of set up with this sort of arranged marriage to Carl. And this really the hope of her mother is that this is, this is gonna sort of save the family. Of course, on, on the course of the, the journey on the Titanic, Rose comes into contact with a poor artist named Jack who has really nothing to his name, but is likable and you know, there's a spark between them there. And really then the narrative of, of the story is, you know, who, who will she choose? Will she choose the one that really she loves and who loves her? Will she choose love over the fortune and what will be good for her family? 
but notice the way different people receive this story. In the West, we receive that story and we say, oh, oh wow, what an amazing romantic story. What an amazing romantic notion that, you know, she has seemingly life kind of made and set up for her with this guy, but she knows it's not right for her. She knows that he's really not that great. She knows that there's not really that much feelings there. So she does what's true to herself and she goes for the guy who really loves her. And we in the West think that's an amazing story of love winning over comfort. However, if you're part of a collectivist society, if you live perhaps in the global South or in the global East, you will receive that story very differently because you will look at Rose and you'll say, you know what? It really is a shame that her and Cal really don't have that much of a spark. There's really not much love and feelings there. It's a shame that he's really in some ways a very flawed character, arrogant, prideful, uh, you're just not very nice. That is a shame. But her first duty and responsibility is to her family. She should have married him anyway for the sake of her family. She should have been able to put her feelings and her preferences aside to say, you know what? As bad as he may be, if I marry him, this saves my family's legacy. And that's more important. How you see the world greatly shapes how you receive that story. Elimelech's decision then to leave his clan, to leave his people, to leave his responsibilities to the other members of his clan, to break away on his own, looks all the more shocking. And it's supposed to. And yet, we have this spoiler alert here that, that Boaz is coming in, part of the clan of Elimelech, and we might see a very, very different approach from him. In chapter 10, all the men were gone, and now we get this prospect of a new man, a new future. And we get a bit of insight into Boaz here, again in verse 1 here, that he's a, a worthy man whose name was Boaz, meaning in him was strength. Uh, there's different ways actually that this has been translated sort of over the years, whether it's worthy man or a man of stature or a man who is wealthy and influential. The answer is to, you know, well, how should we translate it? What does it mean? What is it saying about Boaz is, well, probably all of the above. Put short, uh, he passes the sniff test especially with other men. I mean, do you know, you have that thing, I don't drink milk, I can't stand it, it's not very good for me. But I, I see from other people uh, that, you know, the way to sort of test whether it's gone or not, it's just sent simply that little sort of sniff test, isn't it? Oh, and you can just tell when it's gone. Well, a similar thing happens, actually, I'm not sure if this, this probably happens for women as well, but I can only give you sort of my own experience experience as a, as a male is that there's a something of a sniff test about other guys you know when you when you have a woman in your life you, you care about you value you look out for and they come into contact with another guy and there's a prospect that maybe they might get together there's something of a sniff test that occurs you think well you know is he really good enough or is he really going to look out for her is he really going to care for her right and men invariably are able actually to sniff out those who are worthy of respect and those who are not, Boaz passes the sniff test. He has respect. People will look to him as being honorable, someone who can hold down a job, hold down his responsibilities. He's reliable, he's trustworthy. His word means something. It's the opposite of the kind of guy who will say, oh, you know, I just get on better with girls. You know what that's code for? It's code for other men don't like him. It's code for he doesn't have other male friends. He doesn't have other male friends because they sniff him out. There's something up. Might not be able to put their finger exactly on it, but they can sniff him out. Boaz passes the sniff test. And all of this leads us to ask, well then, why is Boaz not yet married? Seems strange. Seems to be a guy who has everything going for him and we'll see more of that as the story progresses we know of Ruth's difficult journey so far but Boaz may well have had a difficult journey of his own that we just simply don't have written out for us right here because he's not the primary focus of the story the primary focus of the story is is the two women 
But what we see here is he's a great bloke, but things just haven't quite happened for him. But it's not anything to do with him. He's not the problem. He's a worthy man. And not only is he worthy, but we see here uh, in verse four that he's a godly man. We see him coming uh, back to his field here, looking at his workers, uh, looking over them. It tells us here in verse four, and behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and he said to the reapers, the Lord be with you. And they answered, the Lord bless you. He's a godly man and his workers know it. They know how to respond back to him as he pronounces the Lord's blessing over them. This is a man who has spoken of his faith to his workers, evidently. He's a worthy man. He's a godly man. He's a good boss, so it seems. And so, although he doesn't arrive until verse four here, the narrator is excited, maybe a bit too excited, wanted to show us this is a big deal. This is a really big deal. He's an important character here. God has got a plan after all. And so we go just back to verse two to follow it on again here. We're told here, Ruth the Moabite said, let me go to the field. Again, the narrator wants to flag this up for us just to remind us again, just to make the comment, make the contrast here that Ruth the Moabite, Ruth the foreigner has said, right, I'm going to go out to the field and I'm going to find food for us. She's taking on the responsibility here of providing. And we know from other places in the Old Testament that this uh, provision was allowed. There's something of a concern that there just always be inbuilt, not so much into government, but into actually just every individual's uh, ongoing life so that it doesn't depend on which particular sort of government sort of may come in. But that there's an expectation of something of a natural social welfare system. And the Torah makes provision for the poor uh, uh, just a part of ongoing agricultural policy. Uh, Leviticus 19, we're told here in verse 9, when you reap, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge. Neither shall you gather the gleanings after harvest, you shall not strip the vineyard bare, neither shall you gather the fallen grapes, you shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. You're going to leave a certain amount always, every year, every harvest, no matter how much it is you get, you're not going to go right to the extents of what you could reap in. You're going to always leave a certain percentage there for whoever needs it, whether they're poor or whether they're sojourners. That is maybe in modern English, asylum seekers, refugees. You're going to leave a certain amount there always for them. We're told uh, later on, it's repeated in Leviticus 23 and also in Deuteronomy 24 here, we're told when you reap your harvest in your field, and you forget a sheaf in your field, you shall not go back to get it. It shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. It also goes on to talk of grapes and olives as well. The idea is that whatever happens, you must leave an amount there for those who are not able to provide for themselves, for whatever reason that may be. And you must do that in order for the Lord to bless your work. The question perhaps we need to ask is how does Ruth know that? And the answer is probably the obvious one. Ruth is familiar with the scriptures. She knows that this is a God-given provision. She knows that God has provided and allowed for this. So she intends to go out and to go and to take what God has provided for her. Let me go to the field. Let me go and glean. We see that she's a godly woman, familiar with the scripture and trusting in God, trusting in the provision he's given here. But look to verse three here. It tells us here she happened to come to the field of Boaz. And the word there could literally mean now luck brought her to the field of Boaz. She's wound up there, and we know already from the narrator telling us about Boaz and giving us the hint that this could be the hope for us in the immediate sort of future here. This has happened to her, but not because of her. 
as far as she's concerned, she's no idea where she is and who owns the land. She just knows that whoever's land it is, God has given her provision that there's going to be enough there for her to glean to go and to take home to cover her immediate needs. She's had no plan here. As far as she's concerned, as far as she can see it, it's luck. And yet, we know it's not. And we know it's not, first by the narrator giving us all the introduction to Boaz there and as things develop and we see Boaz giving far beyond what the expectations were within the law. In Proverbs 16, we're told of this kind of interplay between on the one hand, what seems to be luck and yet also the quiet hand of God providentially uh, meeting our needs tells us uh, that the lot is cast and falls in the lap, but it's every decision comes from the Lord. What appears for all the world to you to be luck, God is long foreordained. God enacts here his providence through human action. Do you see that there's again that interplay between, as far as she knows, this, this is just luck that she winds up in Boaz's field. And yet there's the human action of she's gone out to a field to go and to glean, known that God provides for it. He provides this within his law for those who are struggling, but also this is going to require some work from me. And so she goes out and she works hard. And there's that interplay between, on the one hand, human work and exertion, and also God's gracious providence. And we also see that there's just simply no chance. There's no blind luck in anything. And now Boaz comes across her here, verse 5, and asks, whose young woman is this? And here the narrator wants to give us another little spoiler, I think, as well. He asks, whose woman is this? Um, narrator's trying to make it clear here. Boaz is really interested in Ruth. He, he's asking because he's thinking, wow, who's she? <laughs> I've not seen her before. Where's she from? Who's, what he's asking is, um, who's she married to? Assuming that, you know, she would be. It may seem like chance for Ruth to be in Boaz's field, as far as she's concerned, and yet God has drawn her there and gone has uh, made sure that it's that particular field of belonging to that particular man. And yet Boaz might as well actually say the exact same thing of himself. What chance that Ruth ended up in my field? Wow. <laughs> and yet there's no chance or no blind luck in it at all. So we're told Ruth continues to, uh, to glean from early morning until now, keeps working really hard to provide for a mother-in-law. And we see that uh, gracious, loving uh, sacrifice of Ruth, that she's willing to just do whatever she has to do to provide for a mother-in-law. And we see of that of ourselves at times we're called to work really hard whilst God does provide for us. There's also that need of hard work. We see a chance encounter. And now we see uh, both Ruth's faith and Boaz's favour in verses 8 to 13 here. Boaz says here, verse 8, listen, my daughter. And notice even there, just stop there at the, at the first phrase there. Boaz is already including Ruth in his clan. See what he's doing there? That's really significant. He's treating her as family and all the rights that go along with that, that we'll learn in a little bit that the responsibilities that Boaz has, but he's including her within that, right from the off here. Listen, my daughter, don't go to another field. He tells her, but keep close to my women. He's caring for Ruth, not just as an alien. There's an expectation in the Torah there that he should care for Ruth just as an alien, just as a stranger, just as an asylum seeker, just as a widow, one who is poor. There's an expectation that he must do that anyway. But he's not caring for her just as a widow or someone who is poor, but he's welcoming her as family with family rights. And so saying, stay here with me. Don't go wandering off to every other field. Must have been a temptation, I suppose, to have done something of a circuit of the different fields around you. So you don't have to spend so much time all in the one place. 
saves an amount of embarrassment, saves an amount of dependence just on any one place, saves people getting frustrated with you. But Boaz is called to stay here with me. Make use of all that I have for you here. And he encourages her further. He says, have I not charged the young men not to touch you? This is a risky place for Ruth. We're reminded just at the beginning there that she is a foreigner. And as much as the Torah and God's word has made provision uh, for those who come from other lands to be uh, welcomed into society and made part of it and provided for and cared for and respected and given the same fundamental dignity and human rights, there's sometimes a gap between what God's word says and what God's people do. And arguably one of the purposes of the book of Ruth is to challenge the people of God, Israel, as to how they respond to foreigners. Because here's this foreigner, Ruth, who is in many ways uh, more godly and faithful than some of the people brought up in the land of God's people. Ruth is at risk here. She could have been a target of a sort of blind, ignorant racism or xenophobia here. even though the law tells them to care for these people, we know that in practice, very often that didn't happen, sadly. Ruth already sees uh, an extraordinary favor that Boaz is giving her here. She asks in verse 10 here, why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I'm a foreigner? She recognises it, that the reality is, and certainly the reality would be in other parts of the world too, that people migrating in are not treated favourably. And there's that temptation even today for that to be the case. Very dangerous, isn't it, when that's, you know, become sort of part of the political and public conversation over the last few years of the ideas of immigration policies and who is it that we really sort of value above others there's a real danger in some of that but without wanting to take any particular political side but just to talk about humanity for a second is there's very very much a danger of sort of judging people by points certain people being more valuable than others whatever it is that you actually classify as the sort of things to measure to make certain people more desirable than others. And we don't want to have anything to do with the people who are not so desirable. Very dangerous place to be, a place that seems to run against God's word and his command and his expectations. Ruth realizes that the reality is, no matter what God's word may say, is that she's at risk. So why are you being so good to me? It's such a loving favour from Boaz that it needs an explanation. (laughs) Why are you being this good to me? Just as we find with God himself, a level of grace and love that needs explanation. Boaz tells her here, verse 11, all that you've done for your mother-in-law, he's heard the story of all that she's done and all that she's been through. And so because of that, because of her faith, Boaz grants his favour. And look at this in verse 12 here. He says, the, the Lord repay you for what you've done and give you full reward for the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you've come to take refuge. Boaz is even recognising here that uh, we we mentioned it last week that in Ruth's decision to come to Bethlehem to leave her people and to go to where the people of God live was a decision motivated by faith and was a decision decision motivated by the desire to follow Naomi's gods not her gods of her homeland and Boaz even has recognised this as one who has picked up the story second hand and grants that the Lord would Asks that the Lord would repay her for all she's done, reward her and bless her for having taken shelter under the Lord's wings. It's a quote, almost word for word, of uh, part of Psalm 91 that that David had uh, read uh, a bit of for us earlier on. Recognises that Ruth is doing something far beyond uh, just sticking with Naomi. 
We see Ruth's faith and Boaz's favour. Thirdly, we see uh, Boaz going far beyond the call of duty. We've begun to see that already, but the narrator keeps now winking and nudging at us here to show there's more going on for us here than just Boaz treating her favourably, being kind towards her, being compelled and inspired by her story. That's all true as well. He is no doubt inspired and compelled by her story and her faithfulness and her loyalty uh, to Naomi. But there's something more. Verse 14 here, look at this. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, come here and eat some bread or have some food and dip the morsel in the wine with me. It could be even vinegar or sour wine. Uh, we know that verse 13 here is, is true. It is, he says here, then she said, I found favour in your eyes, my Lord. for You've comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I'm not one of your servants. We know that's true. By now, what's happening here. Ruth, the foreign sort of begging girl, is invited to dinner. And by the sounds of it, a nice dinner. I mean, if you thought that sort of dipping bread in balsamic vinegar was a sort of uh, invented by yuppies in the sort of mid 2000s, well, it turns out you would be wrong. This was happening sort of uh, centuries uh, before us. Here they are sharing dinner together. There's something more going on for Boaz here than just the sort of kindness and responsibilities as a sort of clan leader here. It says uh, she ate until she was satisfied and had some left over. There's a bonus here that the meal's so good. She has a doggy bag to take home with her to Naomi. We read of that in verse 18 that she brings that home to her. And he gives her further perks and, and privileges here. Verse 15, let her glean among the sheets uh, uh, and don't reproach her. He's giving her privileged access to even more grain, to better uh, grain. There's more going on for Boaz here than just meeting his expectations, though he's doing that. There's more going on than just in taking compassion, though he is doing that. He goes on even further to say, pull out some from the bundles for her. This is not normally expected. We know that because in verse 15 and 16 here, he has to comment to his workers here, don't reproach her, verse 15. And verse 16, don't rebuke her. Don't tell her off. This isn't normal, no, but she's allowed to. And we know that she collects here an ephah of barley. A um, bit inconclusive sort of how much that is in terms of modern measurements. There's kind of two uh, strains of thoughts. So it either could be around about 29 pounds. That would be about 13 kilograms or 47 pounds. That is about 21 kilograms. Either way, that is a lot of barley. So much so that Naomi, when Ruth returns home, asks, where have you gleaned today? <laughs> What field have you been in to collect this much? This is extraordinary. And Ruth is wily. She's wise. She's experienced. And so she says, verse 19, blessed be the man who took notice of you. She works it out. Somebody has taken a shine to you, Ruth. Could be the only reason that they would be this kind to you. This kind of loving favour has only one explanation. Somebody has fallen in love with you. If, there was, if that was hopeful, and it is, now finally sort of the characters catch up with what we knew from verse 1, verse 19 here. The man's name was Boaz. And now finally the dots connect for a... Uh, Naomi, as she works out, well, this is one of our clan. This is one of our family. This is someone who will see us right. There's more going on than just the call of duty. Uh, finally, we see here God's providence. I don't know if you've sort of uh, watch those kind of films where you, you get to the end and there's that big kind of reveal that makes sense of the whole story along it, whether it's a sort of murder mystery kind of a thing, an Agatha Christie sort of thing, or, or if you've ever seen the, the movie, The Usual Suspects, where you finally see uh, Verbal Kim, the seemingly uh, sort of weak, frail uh, mouth, basically no sort of strength to him, just talks and talks and talks, talks of all this sort of myth and legend of Kaiser Soze, and you see him walk out of the police station and you suddenly see him walk up straight and realize that actually he was Kaiser Soze all along. 
But now we finally see, or the characters finally see, what we've known all along. God has provided through sending Boaz. And so Naomi here gives us the summary to sort of close this scene off for us here. She says, verse 20, May you be blessed by the Lord, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. That is them too, but also Elimelech and the two sons as well. But their line is going to be continued now because of uh, Boaz's redemption here that he's going to bring to the family. The interesting thing is, turn back to that verse 20 there. May he be blessed by the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living of the dead. Whose kindness is it that Naomi is talking about? Is it Boaz? He certainly has been kind. He'll continue to be kind again into the next couple of chapters. Or is it God's? He certainly too has been incredibly kind. I think it's both. The kindness of God working out through Boaz. The kindness of God worked out in sending Boaz. Boaz bringing the kindness of God and how he's providing for Ruth and for Naomi. The real hope here is pinned in verse 20 here. The man is a close relative of ours one of our redeemers and there is where the hope is we already had a bit of an insight to some of this from verse one that he's a man of wealth man of influence man of stature and now this becomes important here but now Ruth and Naomi realize this importance why this was such good news that it was Boaz particularly the old testament again much like those provisions for the poor and for the widow and for the asylum seeker in terms of gleaning in the fields there's provision made within clans for there to be certain figures who were kinsmen redeemers that is those who can step in and deliver members of the clan of that extended family from difficulty and from suffering they might uh, redeem them from poverty or they might uh be able to um, uh, redeem them from uh, a crime that's been committed against them. Or they might be able to avenge the blood of uh, a murdered family member, or indeed receive compensation uh, for a wrong done to another uh, dead relative. There was someone who was there with wealth, with means, in order to be able to provide for those part of the extended family who found themselves in difficulty and this is Boaz's role here and now the narrator just reminds us one more time here Ruth the Moabite said even though she is still technically an outsider in some ways she's been welcomed in she says he said you should keep close by my young men we're pulled back down to earth just for a moment here in verse 22 just to say well as Naomi comments on that to say well that's good lest in another field you be assaulted and we're just reminded there in really quite a harsh and abrupt way that the reality of the risk for Ruth outside of uh, Boaz's kind re redemption that actually this is this is a person that at this point in time quite wrongly quite against the word of God would have found themselves in great difficulty, perhaps even with the people of God. Society then would say, well, Ruth doesn't deserve this. Shouldn't we think of our own first? Largely due to her race. One of the themes of the book is to challenge the nation's view of foreigners. Because God's kingdom was always supposed to be one that welcomes all. And yet we see uh, the characters breaking off from the heart of God at, at various moments. And then some of them finding God's heart. We see Naomi discouraging Ruth and Orpah from joining the people of God as if there's no benefit to being part of the people of God. There's just simply no benefit to anyone outside of this. We see the society at the time saying, in essence, the benefit isn't really for you. It's for us already inside. And yet we see in Boaz saying, welcome. Welcoming Ruth. Saying, come. And share in all that I have.
And the scene ends by telling us that Ruth goes on to glean until the end of the barley harvest. We'll come to the further scenes as we see that relationship develop and, and blossom. But for now, what the narrator wants to tell us and show us is that their short term to maybe medium term security is assured. They're going to be able to find a way to make ends meet. We left off and, and begun this morning with them having left Moab, not sure of their future, going back, hoping to be able to find a future, to be able to find a way to make ends meet in the immediate term and beyond. And now we've already had that answered. And now we'll see perhaps what God will do far beyond that too. So we come back to that question and we began with a question, how will God provide for Ruth and for Naomi? How will he provide for us as we read this today? Well, the evidence of the story gives us four things. Firstly, quietly. God does not say anything in this chapter. He's been quiet. And yet he's delivered quite evidently. And God's provision for us very often is quiet. Very often, actually, is not, not with fanfare, a great celebration, but he just quietly delivers for us. How will God provide? Well, probably be unexpected, as it is in this story. Two characters were not expecting God to provide in this way at all. Their greatest hope was that they might be able to make some ends meet by making use of the provisions within the Torah to go and to glean from the edges and the surplus of a farmer's field. And I think really probably that was the extent of what they were really realistically hoping for in that moment. And God goes far beyond it and in an unexpected way may well also be an unexpected provision for Boaz too, who though a good man has been a lonely man for whatever reason. And yet, all of a sudden, in an instant, his story too is changing. How does God provide? Well, he provides through people. How he provides here for Ruth and Naomi through a person. And so often for us, that will be the case too. And he provides above and beyond above and beyond anything they could have realistically expected. But we began this morning and we end in the same place, saying this story was really all about God providing a better man. How will he provide for us? What does he provide? Well, we find our story, like Naomi and Ruth's, is a tale of two men. It's a tale of two men who make defining and representative decisions for us. With Adam and Jesus. Through Adam's decision to reject God's word, to abandon his rule, we face judgment too, as members of his clan, descended from him, sharing the same DNA, sharing the same kind of nature. He finds himself and we find ourselves exiled from God's presence. We find relationships strained. We find the earth around us cursed and broken in so many ways. Though God had given Adam everything, everything you could imagine to have a perfect life, he threw it away to reach out for more. He reached out to the tree, to the forbidden fruit, to grasp at an authority not his own. And it's brought judgment for us ever since. And you might think, you might ask, the question might be there, well, that seems harsh. I didn't do that. That wasn't me. That was him, surely. And yet we have. We've all rejected God too. But we're all related. He's our representative. We've all sinned. We've all believed that God isn't good at some point. We've all believed that he's not right, but that we are. We know better. We've all believed in moments that he's not to be trusted. I think I can trust me more than I can trust him. And so we all face judgment too, even though our sin may look different to his. And that one sin has brought us all down too. Much 
like Elimelech's sin, ruins his family. For all the good decisions he may have made over the course of his life, that one bad decision causes a legacy of ruin for his family. But God, in his grace, sent forth a better man. That's the hope of the gospel. That God, in the face of that very sin, in the face of that very rejection and distrust, sends a better man, a better representative. Jesus, like his father, only ever doing what was good and right and perfect, meeting every expectation of the law, living the life we should have lived in our place. And though he had all the privileges that being the son of God gives it up for us, just as Boaz gives up out of all the wealth that God had given him and blessed him to save and to redeem Ruth and Naomi and Elimelech's line. Jesus, though, having all, gives it all up that we might be spared judgment, that he might share all of that with us. He could have sat back and enjoyed all he had, but he gives himself up so that he can share it out with us and Jesus hands are stretched up to a tree not to grasp a power that wasn't his but to give up power that was his his hands are stretched out on a tree as he gives himself up that he might save us from the curse because Jesus lived the life we should have lived he can die the death we should have died what does God provide he provides for us a better man. We have a glimpse of it here in Boaz. But Boaz is nothing compared to Jesus. But he gives us a glimpse of how it is that God works, what it is that God does in the face of sin, in the face of suffering, in the face of poverty and distress. He gives a better man, Jesus. And though you might have felt it unfair that you be held accountable for what Adam did, even though we've all also done much the same thing. It is also true to say it is unfair that we receive the blessing of God for what Jesus did. And it is wildly unfair. It is instead incredibly gracious incredibly loving favor so I'll finish just with these couple of verses here and then we'll we'll sing our closing song and then and then david will uh, uh, close for us back down at showcase this is from 1 timothy chapter 2 verses 4 to 6 speaking of god here he desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth for there is one god and there is one mediator between god and man the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. And I hope this morning, whatever you may feel, wherever you may be at, whatever stage you may be at in your faith or still exploring that, whatever struggles you may be facing this morning, and I know for a number of you, you'll be probably facing significant struggles just at this moment, whether that's with... Uh, health whether that's with mental health whether that's with job security whether that's with worry for family members oh, it could be all manner of things couldn't it there are many of us struggling with many different things but i hope and pray this morning that what you'll have heard this morning and what you'll know and receive and be encouraged in your heart is god's answer to that is to provide a better man jesus who makes all things good